Hi, my name is Carol Shabalala or Simply Carol. I'm a sportscaster and I am here today uh, because of a wonderful campaign called Inspired By. Now, this campaign is the brainchild of Ticket Target and the Gauteng Department of Sports, Arts, Culture and Recreation. Now, what they did is they went all across the Gauteng province and they spoke to um, an, a number of young individuals. And uh, the youth uh, spoke out about the individuals that inspire them in the sporting fraternity. Now, of uh, the number of votes that came in, they took the top four uh, votes, uh, for the, the top four number of votes for the sporting personalities. I'm one of the top four, and I'm very excited about that. So that's why I'm here. I'm here to meet five of these uh, really fantastic individuals that said that I inspire them. I want to meet them, hear their story, uh, further inspire them. And I think uh, once I get to know them and hear a little bit more, they will in turn inspire me. So let us meet them, shall we? Hello. Hello, Miss Carol. How are you? I'm so good. Tell me about yourself. Yeah. Uh, my name is Rene Lekekana. I am a law student. Yes. And I'm from Pretoria. Okay. Nice. All right. Hello, Miss Carol. I'm Sandile Shabalala. Mm -hmm. I'm from, I'm a CPT graduate for sports management and I currently stay in Morningside Center. Nice. Yeah. Hi, Carol. My name is Zenande Funani. I'm a 23-year-old who was born and bred in the Eastern Cape, Emaglia, in a small village, actually, Hopedale. Um, I currently reside in the south of Johannesburg, and I'm so excited to be here and be in conversation with you. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Hello, Miss Carol. Hi. <laughs> and my name is Sifiso Mkwanazi. I'm from Social Nguve, and I'm currently volunteering at Radio Social Nguve, doing sports presenting, oh. and I'm so excited to be here. Nice. All right. Hi, Oscar. Hi. My name is Ayanda Sidlai. I'm 27 years and I'm currently based at Johannesburg South and I'm an author, but you inspire me to be in the sport entertainment industry. Nice. Okay. Yes. Excellent. Well, let's get straight into it. I know that uh, you've got a couple of questions. You want to know about my journey and such. Um, I think we're going to start off with Renee Lue. Um, yeah, fire away. What would you like to know? Um, Ms. Carol, I would like to know yeah. what was going through your mind when you decided that you want to be a part of this male-dominated industry of sports mm -hmm. at a young age at as a, young a black age. woman. Yeah. All right. So uh, my journey is a very interesting one, actually. I don't know if a lot of people knew, but um, from a young age, I never ever inspired. I, was, I wasn't um, inspired to be in the sporting industry or in a sporting world. Mm -hmm. I loved sport from a very young age. I come from a, a family that's... Uh, really passionate when it comes to sport. Um, I was born in Pimville, Soweto. So, um, you know, you can imagine which team they support. My dad is from <laughs> Orlando. Oh. Uh, my mom is from Middleland. So oh. it's one of the Soweto giants. So the entire family supported. Uh, we loved our football. We loved our boxing. So sport has always been a part of my life. Um, even growing up, obviously, I was um, active. Um, at, at primary school, at high school, netball. I was a very good netballer. Um, I was good when it came to cross country as well. Um, those were my main sporting events that I took part in. But I wasn't um, the best sporting personality. So um, not good enough. I was good, you know, for, for school level, but not good enough to like, you know, take it more like at a provincial level or, you know, represent the country. Uh, so I, I, sport has always been a part of my life, but I never, ever wanted to be or even thought that I could make it in the sporting industry. That wasn't a dream that I had from a young age. The dream that I had because I was extremely outgoing. Um, I've got a wonderful voice. So I thought I, I always knew that judging from my personality, um, I would have a profession in the entertainment industry. So I thought I was going to become an actress. Mm -hmm. um, I thought maybe not so much a presenter, but I really thought actress or a singer. Um, and that's what I'd always wanted to be, especially in high school. You know, once you're in high school, I think you start to really uh, see the areas that you're strong in and what you think you might become after high school. So for me, I was like, you know what? This is it. You know, I was uh, I took part in all of the cultural activities at, at school. Um, I was in the singing uh, company. I was uh, a debater. I was in public speaking wow. um, and I was also a leader, you know, so I was in the uh, student body. I was on the governing body.
everybody. I represented the entire school. So very strong personality, very outgoing. And I was the type of individual that gets along with everyone as well. Um, and it was only towards matric, the end of matric, um, I always used to take part in beauty pageants at school. And I'll tell you why, before you judge, <laughs> some of you judge. And the reason why is uh, because uh, we struggled a lot. We didn't have a lot of money. Um, so way before, while I was still in primary school, my long story short, uh, my parents separated um, and we were homeless with my mom and my siblings. We literally lived like from back room to back room. Um, and that's why, that's something else as well that really pushed me to get the best marks and to take part in as many activities as I possibly can, sport, cultural, so that I could open up the opportunities as well for me after school because we didn't have the money for me to go to like a university and further um, my studies in whatever career. Um, so there was always something in the back of my mind. I was hoping that somewhere along my journey, like especially during high school, an opportunity would open up. And there were a couple along the way. I remember I was doing like a, a public speaking event, a big national public speaking event um, and someone approached me they were from Mnet and they were like oh you know you're so outspoken you're so great um, you should come out in audition to be one of our presenters for I forget now but it was um, uh, for for what was it called um, uh, I remember the, the the presenters were like Carly like the the youth programs that they Your used to TV? have uh, no, no, no. For on Mnet, it was. Oh, sorry. Um, it wasn't your TV, but yeah, something Somewhere similar to your TV. Yes, but it was on Mnet. So there were a lot of these little opportunities, you know, throughout. Like, um, you know, when I used to do like a lot of these plays, um, mm. especially when we went and we competed against other schools, you know. So I was just hoping that, you know, with my great grades, with my um, wonderful much. performances, you know, someone was gonna spot me and then give me this wonderful opportunity, and I was. The reason why I was doing the, the pageants was because we didn't have a lot of money. And I found that I had a knack for winning. You know, mm -hmm. I was always like Miss Personality. I got along with everyone. You know, my mom would sew my outfits. And when you win, you want some amazing prizes. So like getaways, you want like, um, you know, products that you could pamper that I could use to give to my mom so she can pamper herself, chocolates and all those things that we couldn't necessarily afford. That's the only reason why I used to take part in pageants. So I was doing a pageant um, and I was in high school. I was doing Miss uh, uh, Krugersdorp High Hostel. I was at the boarding school. I was in uh, grade 11. And uh, one of the judges was a uh, presenter at the time for um, SABC uh, called a continuity presenter, Graham, Graham Hopkins. He was Graham Hopkins at the time. Mm -hmm. Now he's Graham Richards. And he was one of the judges. So... You know, we were all like, oh, my word. He was like the most famous person at that time. And we were so excited to see him there. I think I ended up being the second princess. But afterwards, I was like, I'm going to take my chance. I'm going to go up and, you know, tell him that I want to be in television. I want to do what he does. He was a continuity presenter, you know. So I thought, listen, that's a good way in. You know, you start there and then eventually I'll be acting in like a, a soapy or a movie <laughs> or whatever. Uh, my aspiration was to win the first Oscar uh, for South Africa eventually. So I wanted to be the Charlize Theron at the time. <laughs> and then um, I spoke to him and I said, wow, you know, I love what you do. You, yeah. You're fantastic. You're so outgoing. You're personable. I, I, and I love it. And this is something that I would like to pursue. And he said, okay, listen, here's my mobile number. He gave me his actual cell number. Obviously, I thought it was fake. He said, call me tomorrow <laughs> and let's um, have more of this conversation. I took his number. Didn't think it was real, obviously. Next day, phoned him. You know, and we still had the the, uh, the the coin phones yeah mm. i phoned him from hostel and he answered like after the second ring and he said listen come through to the sabc and see what it is that i do so that's the first lesson that that, that i have for all of you guys is that if you're interested in doing something it's so important that you take a step like you guys have to learn a little bit more about the industry about this particular career what happens behind the scenes what does it take uh, because what you see the final outcome is not necessarily what happens behind the scenes you know and he said no let me let me show you a little bit more about what what actually happens you know behind the scenes and how it is that i get on it so he said no come through to the sabc i went um, took a taxi, went through, and when I arrived, he was doing a voiceover. So a voiceover is, for a lot of the recorded shows, sports shows, 
Um, so you'll record uh, the footage. Mm. And then afterwards, when you come and they edit and they fine tune it and they put the program together, they'll need someone who will do the voice, you know, yeah. um, to the pictures. So he was doing voiceovers for a junior sports show called Sports Buzz. Mm. And when I arrived, he was actually doing, he was in the voiceover. So I was like, oh, is this the voiceover? And he did the voiceover. And I sat there watching him, like just mesmerized, like, okay, this is what happens. This is part of putting a show together. You see the final show, you know, with the voice and everything. And I was like, okay. And then the, his producer, so the person that was directing the voiceover and telling him, okay, go, you know, uh, telling him exactly uh, which lines to read at which time uh, in the script. Her name was Melinda Lombard. Mm. And uh, she looked at me and she said, oh, OK, uh, are you interested in this? And I said, yes, you know, I want to I want to be in the industry. Um, and then she said, OK, do you want to take the script and just try Just try doing a voiceover. Right. Mm. I did not hesitate. Now, as I said, you know, I was in debating. I was this. I used to read on a daily. I used to read like a book uh, every two days. I used to finish a book every two days. Um, so reading a script, like they give it to you and you just have to read it with feeling. That's where all of my debating, public speaking, even the acting um, experience came in. So I took the script um, and I think it was rugby, you know, mm. and I didn't know much about rugby, but because I'm a good reader, you know, I could read it with feeling and it sounded like I knew. And I took one take, no stumbles, no arms, no whatever. And she said, wow, that was amazing. It was a short script. And she says, wow, OK, that was good. Um, can you come back next week and try that again? And she used that, that read that I did, she used it for the actual show. And she wow. said, um, come back next week. And I was like, yeah, sure. You know, so that's the other lesson is, you know, you always need to be prepared. You never know where your opportunity or that little window is going to come from. You know, um, if I had not agreed to just try it out, you know, she said, just try it out. If I had said, no, nah, or if I was like nervous or anything like that, then, you know, my story wouldn't have started, you know, there. Um, so, yeah, then I started coming back every week. I started doing the, the, uh, the voiceovers. Then she said, um, do, you, do you know how to write scripts? And I was like, writing? I mean, I also used to write. I was like, yeah, sure. You know, and she was like, okay, so they'll bring the footage in. I'll look at the footage and then I write the story. Now, what made it easy for me is that Sports Buzz was junior sports. So it was like, yeah. you know, um, the kids there, it's like under five, development, mm. grassroots. It was easy. So mm. I didn't have to be technical um, in terms of the, 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 the sports language that I used in the scripts. Just easy stuff, you know. Um, so that was easy to write scripts for. And even though I didn't know a lot of the sporting codes, like I said, I mean, I knew my football and my boxing. Uh, but a lot of the stuff that we did on Sports Buzz was like, um, and I knew my netball, was like cricket and rugby, you know. And I didn't know a lot of the lingo there. But I didn't need it at the time because it was junior. Mm -hmm. So it was a good way for me to learn about those sporting codes. So then I started writing my scripts and then doing the voiceovers, which was even easier. They had a presenter at the time called Sebulelo Mokanyani. Um, she was one of the, the, they had two presenters. She was one of the presenters. And she left for um, a new television show uh, or, or broadcaster that came on the scene, ETV. And they did a breakfast show called uh, The Toasty Show. So she left Sports Buzz to go and be a presenter on The Toasty Show. So now they had a gap. And then Melinda one day asked me and said, are you interested in becoming a presenter? I was like, you know, I thought you'd never <laughs> ask. Yes, I'm ready. Um, so that's where it started. So I went out on the field and now I could actually watch these kids, you know, um, performing. I could listen to the coaches and in them learning because it was development. I learned as well. So I was given an opportunity to learn a little bit more about all of these other sporting codes um, and even football. But from a grassroots level, not like up level you know so i learned along with them so it was the perfect way for me to get into the industry and then my passion for sports and sport broadcasting grew from there you see so um my i think my journey is a very it's a unique one in that sense in that mm -hmm. it's not something that i was always wishing to do or hoping to pursue uh, and i always say my job kind of found me you know, it was meant to be. It was destined. It, it, it found me. And then I was in it. And yeah, before you know it, I was, 
you know, going from strength to strength. Because a lot of people say, wow, were you always so good? You know, was your knowledge always like <laughs> this good in sport? Mm-hmm. No, you know, I, I, I just, I was just a fan, a, a regular fan, like a lot of people. Uh, but then when I started learning about it, then, um, you know, and I got the opportunity to learn from like grass, grassroots, and then I grew with it. So, yeah, that's my story. Interesting. Yeah. And yes, and then once once I was there, obviously, as you said, male dominated, um, it was male dominated field. I never made that, that choice to say, I want to go and break barriers, all this. Um, and also when I was starting out, there weren't any standout female sports mm. presenters or sportscasters where I could say, I want to be like her, yeah. you know? So I, I, I see that as, as, as a, a wonderful and unique opportunity for me as well to kind of start something new. I, I was given the freedom to fashion my own path. I didn't have any pressure of, of maybe trying to be like someone else. Yeah. Um, that was there. I was just Carol, you know, new. Yeah, so that's what I like is the fact that, you know, I, I didn't have that pressure to say, this is what a female sportscaster is supposed to look like, supposed to sound like. I was given the freedom to just be me mm. um, and, and grow without any kind of pressure. Um, and I was always extremely comfortable and very well supported by my male peers at the time who didn't even see me as competition or a threat. Yeah. You know, then so I was given that 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 freedom to do that. Whereas now, I think especially for for a lot of you, it's a little bit. It's so much more difficult because mm. um, being a sports broadcaster through the years has just now become like a big priority, and our roles and our careers have just blossomed. They're very big globally, and more and more people now want to get into the industry. More and more women as well want to get into mm. the industry, which I really love. But you guys now have examples of people, you know, like myself that have done it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's easier for you guys to say, this is what I want to do. Yes. <laughs> Zananda, yes. <laughs> oh, Carol, that is such an inspiring story, yeah. a background story, because, you know, most of young people in South Africa, they, they, turn, um, they tend to think that their backgrounds determine them. So coming yeah. from you, coming from Soweto and making mm. it so huge and so big, it's truly, truly inspiring. I also just want to say that every time I see you on screen, you are yeah. always looking dazzling. You <laughs> always look so fantastic. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And um, I'm just really excited. I also just want to know, I've read somewhere that you... Well, I'm an aspiring sports um, sports broadcaster as okay. well. So I read somewhere that you've started at Kaya FM. Mm-hmm. Can you please tell me more about that journey and how important it is if you want to get into the industry to also go on radio? Mm-hmm. Just more about that. Yeah, so I, uh, like I said, you know, with my background, um, the fact that, you know, I was so good with public speaking, um, debating, singing. Uh, I always had, I knew that I had a good voice. You know, I've always yes. had, a, I had a good voice. So, um, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, you know, you've got a voice for radio. So then I thought, ah, you know, why not? Let's just venture into radio broadcasting as well. You know, let me also work on radio. And yes, Kai FM um, was the first uh, radio station that I worked for. Um, I did the breakfast show, you know, and that's mm. like, that's where the numbers are. Mm. Yes. Um, and I worked with uh, Bob Mabena, oh, uh, KG Mwakezi, that was like, you know, a fantastic lineup there. And I, yeah, I did the sports news um, and they gave me a nickname called The Rock. Yeah. <laughs> <So I realized laughs> the Rock when I was at Kaya yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, I really loved it. I loved, I loved being on radio. It was just a, a different avenue to what it is that I was doing. But mm. for me, my first love is always be, uh, being a television TV. broadcaster, so. you know, being on the ground. Uh, because with the differences with radio, especially when you're doing, um, you'd know. <laughs> yeah, Spisa would know. Yeah. Uh, when you're doing, when you're doing uh, sports news on radio, mm-hmm. um, you're just compiling the bulletins. You know, you've got like three minutes, I think, just to deliver the news. Mm-hmm. It's like news, you know, yeah. it's like results. being a reporter. Yes. Um, and I want to be more involved with the sports. You know, I want to be there on the ground. Mm-hmm. I want to experience it. I want to talk to the athletes. I want to talk to the coaches. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to interact with the fans as well. So television has afforded me that opportunity. So for me, yeah, television is, is so, bigger. So you never studied anything in that line? I didn't study anything. You see there, that's something else. Yeah. So like I said, when um, when I met uh, Graham, Graham Mm. Richards, um, I was in uh, matric, actually. Mm. I was in matric. 
So I, also the timing was just perfect because I was stressing like, uh, what am I going to do afterwards? Yeah. I mm. went and I did um, auditions at AFTA, yeah. you know, the film school, just just thinking that, I don't know, maybe by some mm. chance or some miracle, I don't know, something was going to come up and I'd be able to actually pay for my tuition or mm. someone would, I don't know. Mm. Um, so I went and I was accepted at AFTA. So I was set to go there, <laughs> but I don't know when that would happen because we didn't have the money um, mm. at home. And then I met Graham towards the end of matric and that's when I went through to the SABC. So I started working at the SABC, even though I wasn't being paid, by the way. I wasn't paid um, to do those voiceovers and the script writing yeah. and the presenting. It was um, end, end of 99, end of 99. And so last year of uh, matric, or was it 2000, class of 2000? Yes, yes, 2000. That's when I started. Yeah. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah. So last couple of months of matric uh, was when that happened. So just the timing so was perfect. Amazing. So straight afterwards, when I was done with matric, I just continued. And what I'd do is I'd be at the SABC like almost every day. Mm. I'd come in, I'd sit in the office, even if I wasn't working, I'd sit in the office, I'd get to meet um, the producers, I'd talk to them, I'd speak to um, some of the booking, the, the guys that do the bookings, you know, people that work in the office. Mm. I, I, I got to know everyone in the office, I was very well liked. I'd just come and, and, you know, just talk to them, I'd be very, very close to the producers. So every time they'd see me, you know, then they'd be yeah. like, um, actually, there's a shoot that just came in. Do you mind going? Yeah. So just being available and being around all the time is something that also helped me to progress in my career. Yeah, yeah. Um, I see. Yeah, um, <laughs> so, I mean, uh, Sandile, you so want to ask something? On your journey, like, yeah. who, who's been a mentor? Who's been a guy to, like you mentioned Graham Richards now. Like, yeah. Are there any other names that have been there throughout your journey so far? Throughout my journey so far, especially in the beginning stages, mm. uh, we had... Um, I think he was a former presenter. He was mm. called Martin Locke. Like mm. he was like an amazing sports uh, sports presenter at the SABC. And when I started out, I think he was now in the twilight of his career, very old. He was like finishing off. Mm. And they used him to kind of mentor and give advice to some of the younger presenters. Mm. Robert Marao also came through Martin Locke. Uh, um, um, Max Maponyan, he came through Martin Locke. Um, and he would just after a broadcast he'd sit us down and then he'd say okay he'd play replay and he said you watch yourself you know and i never used to do that because i always found it i don't know awkward. i always found it strange and awkward <laughs> yeah you know and, I, and i'd be very critical like why did i say that like that why yeah. is my voice like that mm. it just sounds so different when you're actually watching yourself mm. and he said it's very important especially now in the beginning stages to watch yourself uh critique yourself mm. and um yeah, so he was the one who guided me and he said, listen, you know, in, in sport broadcasting, it's just so important to, uh, because I used to speak very fast. I speak fast now, but then I was like super fast. Oh, mm. And he'd always say like, what train are you trying to catch? <laughs> like, slow down. Martin, that was his biggest critique of me. He was like, slow mm. down, you know? And I never used to think it was too much of a problem because you could hear me. I was very audible, as fast as I was, I, so I thought. And he was like, no, you know, for some individuals, like a lot of what you're saying can be lost, you know, if you're too fast. So he taught me to just slow down a little bit more, just a tad. I used to be super fast, you slow down. Um, and then obviously just some of the mannerisms, you know, on camera, just how I'm sitting up, um, a little more of the projection. But mm. a lot of the things that he, he, he told me is stuff that I knew from acting, you know, um, yeah. being on stage, you have to project uh, mm. from mm. being a debater, from doing public speaking. Um, so I knew how to get the best of my, out of my voice. I knew how to project. And then he taught, taught me other things um, that I, I found new in television, like um, reading a script, you know, having an auto cue and reading a script, you know, things like that. But yeah, Martin Locke for me was a, was a big one. Um, other than that, not really. You know, like I said, it was, it was very, because there weren't other females mm -hmm. and, and, and people that I could necessarily um, identify with. You know, the other, the other guys, were, they were gents. They were all guys. So it's not like I could say, ah, you know, I want to be like Max mm. or I want to be like Robert, you know. Mm. Um, and Robert was also fairly new when I started. Mm. I think he had been in the industry for a year or two because wow. he also, he started as a continuity presenter at SNBC1 mm -hmm. and then he moved into yeah. sport, you know. So it's not like 
there was someone that I said, ah, oh, I want to be. And Max, you know, he was a former footballer. Mm, mm. Um, Martin Locke was old and I never grew up like watching him per se. So I didn't have someone that I said, oh, I want to do it like, like that person. Yeah. Mm. When, okay. when, you, when you started um, your first um, presenting, it shows that um, because of the background that you had in terms yeah. of being a public speaker and whatever you did there at that time, um, did that work into your advantage? Big time. Yeah, yeah that definitely works into my mm. advantage. Like I said, um, if, if I wasn't confident in terms of reading mm. um, a script or reading something that, you know, because I was an act, uh, I, I used to be on stage as a, mm. an actor at a high school level, uh, because of that, reading scripts and trying to memorize scripts, that was something that I knew how to do. Um, and as a public speaker as well, you know, you read, you, obviously you make your notes um, and you read it and you read out your speech as a debater, mm. you know, so all of that really helped. That's why when Melinda said, here's a script, do you want to read it? Yeah. I wasn't nervous or like, you know, I grabbed it and I read it so well that that was my end. She used it and then she asked me to come back. So, like I said, a lot of the things that I did before, I think really prepared me for, for getting into the industry and actually flourishing in the industry as well. Yeah. yeah. Ayanda, question from you? Yes, Oscar. <laughs> like, what is your life motto? Do you what have is one? Your life motto. My life motto? Yes. Oh, I have, I have uh, a few, but mainly it's um, keep the passion. That's a very, very big one for me because that, for me, that's what has led me to the heights that I'm at now. Yes. It's because first and foremost, I was always passionate about sport. Now, if you're not passionate about something, mm -hmm. you're not going to be interested in learning more about it. You're not going to be that good. Now, what made me as good and better and better through the years in sports is the fact that first and foremost, I, I love it. I am so, so in love with it, you know. Um, and you found, I found a lot of young, young guys and gals, you know, mm -hmm. that wanted to come into the industry that I've mentored along the way, um, who wanted to get into the industry for the wrong reasons. Yes. Because they wanted fame, mm -hmm. because yeah. they wanted attention of the athletes, <laughs> the soccer players, or um, mm -hmm. they wanted to be able to travel like I do. And, and what they don't realize is that for me to now be at that stage where, you know, I'm going all over the world and um, all of these famous athletes are like my friends, for me to do that, though, it was all of the hard work that I did before. You know, it wasn't yeah. it, it wasn't glamorous in the beginning. Of course, it's glamorous now. Yeah. But this is like, what, 21 years after the, uh, the yeah. fact? Um, obviously, it happened earlier, maybe 10 years one, once I was in. It really started getting extremely yeah. glamorous. But there was a lot of hard work and a lot of um, uh, uh, groundwork that I had to do in order to be as good as I am now. You know, like I said, you know, it was starting off like under fives, you know, nobody's little kids mm. <laughs> and, and, and looking at how it is that they were starting their careers and learning about sport from the ground level. But it's because I was interested in it. So that's what gave me the passion to pursue and to learn more about sports. And people see it, you know, when I'm on air, people can see that I've got a genuine love and passion yeah. for the game. You know, mm. um, it's not forced. It's not something that I have to rehearse. Yeah. That's why as soon as that camera's on, it's, it's easy for me world. to just talk. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> oh man, I'm talking to people yeah. that yeah. like me, you know, love sports um, and, 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 and know the language of sports. You know, I'm it's talking exciting. to like-minded people. So mm. I know that, and that's why I don't even get nervous. I know that the millions that mm. are watching mm. are people that are just like me. You know, yeah. they just love the game and they know about the game. And I know and my knowledge now about the game is like, you know, you. yeah. It's unbelievable, mm. but it's the passion that propelled me. So first of all, you must always keep the passion. And Carpe Diem, mm -hmm. for me, has been the longest one. Seize the moment, because yeah. if you don't, if I didn't grab the opportunities, just those half chances that I was given, it didn't even feel like it was, it wasn't an audition when Melinda said, hey, go read that script. Yeah. That wasn't an audition. Mm -hmm. um, but it ended up becoming my in yeah. because of 
how it is that I performed, how I read that short little script. Yeah. She was just like, wow, okay, come back, mm. you know? Mm. Um, and also I seized the moment when I saw Graham Richards and I was like, oh, I need to talk to him and I need to tell him that what he does, everyone was like shy and like, oh no, we're not going to go, we're not going to say anything. I was like, no, listen, when, when, when next time I'm going to see him, yeah. I'm going to take this opportunity. So yes. I seized the moment and I went up, up to him, you know, spoke to him. And then he said, come to the SABC. If I hadn't spoken to him, I wouldn't have come to the SABC. I wouldn't have met Melinda. I wouldn't have read that script. Probably wouldn't have been here. I, I, I feel like I was destined to be here. Mm -hmm. So maybe it would have taken another route, but a longer yeah. Yeah. route. My story wouldn't have been as amazing as it is now because of that. So yeah, those are my two big mottos. Yeah, being, yeah. being a, a woman at that time, being in this such a, a dominated, male dominated, male, yeah. Yeah, male dominated uh, fraternity, um, what challenges did you come across at that time? Yeah, yeah there were many challenges. Uh, but, you know, uh, I, I think the, the obvious ones that a lot of people ask me about, like... Um, Harassment. You know, like with your, with your colleagues, with your yeah. male colleagues, mm -hmm. you feel like the pressure or the... Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think I answered that already to say yeah. that, no, you know, I wasn't seen as a threat. Um, and I was allowed to kind of just be me. But some of the challenges now when I started being on the field. So, you know, there was sports buzz. And then after two years, I think I did sports buzz for about two years or a year and a half. Uh, I was given the chance to now start doing um, football, like pitch side, mm. pitch side reporting. And uh, they put me in the stands, like with the fans, you know, back, yeah. back then. I don't know. I don't, I don't think we do. We don't really do that as much mm. anymore. Mm. But then you'd have like a presenter, just mm. a reporter to talk to the fans to say, yeah. ah, what's the, what's the prediction? Yeah. <laughs> Which team are you favoring today? You know, and then they shout at you yeah. and they scream, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, easy stuff. So uh, once, once I started doing uh, field reporting, you know, pitch side and I was on the pitch, um, obviously with the fans, it was a lot of men. Like mm. you'd see maybe one woman amongst like yeah. a crowd of like, you know, thousands of men, but like always. So being around Ben and, um, you know, the fans, they're excited and they're like pushing and shoving. So maybe just maybe sometimes feeling a little bit uncomfortable or you're feeling like a bit of a, a grope or a, you understand. Yeah. Mm. So um, I learned very early as well uh, about how to dress, depending on what it is that you're going to do. So if you're going to be amongst the fans, make sure that you're wearing your pants, a nice proper T-shirt that's covering you so that you don't have any wardrobe malfunctions. You know, I think with women, we're way more admin. You know, there's, yeah. there's so much that you, you need to be taking care of what your hair is looking mm -hmm. like and the, the, the clothes as well that you're wearing. Are you in heels? You know, so just um, just being comfortable there. Yeah, so once I started, um, like, now interviewing the players and the coaches, you know when you can tell that, like, the coach will look at you, just that look, you can already tell that they're asking themselves, like, what does she know? Mm. What is she going to ask? You know, they're already undermining you before you even speak. So, I mean, if you were nervous then, before that, you become even more nervous, you know, just because you're being judged. Um, mm. And I mean, I wasn't known, so I was, I was new in the industry. And then you can just tell, like, you're about to ask the question and already that look is like, uh -huh, what are you going to ask me? <laughs> you know? Um, so just, just that, just now having to be strong there, you know, and be confident in what it is that I was going to ask. Uh, and, and then, you know, um, just being prepared. And that's why I always tell people, like, I think as compared to some of my, my colleagues, my male colleagues, like I would make sure that I was like 10 times more prepared. I still do it because it's just habits. Like I make sure that I'm like 10 times, I know like 10 times more. And you'd find that like I'd just be coming into the office and then all of a sudden I'd be quizzed, you know, like, eh, so back in 1962, who won the this and who won the, you know, because people were like, you know, they were always trying to like catch you out or they don't quite believe that you actually know the sports as much as possible. Um, or like I'd be, I'd be doing a show with a co-presenter and then you can just tell like the way that they'd be, you're supposed to be working together, but then they'd end up like questioning you, even radio days, you know, like my, uh, some of my colleagues uh, would then like just uh, uh, arrive and say, ah, oh, do you remember like the biggest game in 1983? You know, and you're like, you know, is this a quiz? Um, so just always be making sure that you are like so, so, so super prepared and you really know your craft. And then 
um, at the time, back then, we were allowed to like go into the change rooms, you know, and, and speak to the players there, the footballers there. So, you know, like after a game, the footballers would just like get undressed maybe. So like having to walk into the change room and um, look at the player like in the eyes, like in the face and not let your gaze stray, like looking at their bare chest, maybe the t-shirts would be off or whatever, you know, um, just always making sure that you remain professional at all times, you know? And then sometimes you can tell like a, a, a footballer thinks, yeah, this one is going to talk to me because she likes me. <laughs> you know, she thinks I'm hot or whatever. So just always being professional. And yeah, so those are just some of the challenges, proving myself, especially in the earlier stages. I wasn't known and uh, people weren't really sure about my my knowledge or, you know, that I, that I could make it. So early stages, I'd say maybe for about two, three years, but then after that, people knew me and like, okay, no, 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 no. You know, because every single time I'd ask them questions that were relevant, really good questions. And I'd ask them in a way that they've never been asked before. Um, and you could tell just from the way that I would qu I ask my questions that I knew what it is that I was doing. So, yeah. You know, that's Renee. Yes, it's been a while. Yes, yeah. Carol. So with all the hard work that it's taken yeah. and starting writing scripts and reading them and not getting paid. Yeah. Was there ever a time where you felt like quitting? And if there was, how did you overcome that? Was there a time when I felt like quitting? Um, no, because I could tell that this was leading somewhere. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I could, the longer that I was in there, I, re I started to realize that, you know what, this is actually where I'm supposed to be. I, I could sense that you know what, if I just stayed, stayed on this particular path, it wouldn't be too much longer before I really started getting paid what I was worth. Because I think I wasn't paid for like maybe four months. And then I started getting paid, but like a little bit, but you know, it was something, you know, and I, I really had to be strong and I, and I had to be focused because while all of this was happening, like my mom and I, I, I have um, a younger sister, you know, they were struggling, um, sometimes, you know, going to bed and they hadn't eaten. So it was, it was really, really tough. Uh, but I could feel, I could already see that, you know what, this is leading somewhere. So, you know, there will be times when you feel like, hey, you know what, this is, it's taking too long, maybe, you know, but you just need to believe in, in your capabilities because I, I was like, oh, you know what, I'm actually made for this. I know I can do it. And at like the biggest stage, on the biggest stage than this, you know. So um, because I believed in myself and I also saw how quickly I got to the stage where I was now finally presenting. And this was still a junior sports show. I knew before long I'd be doing the, the big sporting codes. Yeah. Well, okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, you just spoke about like bigger stages. Yes. So I remember there was a time when you hosted one of the biggest um, events in sports, which yeah. is the Ballon d'Or. Yes, the ceremony. FIFA Ballon d'Or. How yeah. did that come about? It was so huge. I know. And um, were you nervous? How did that work? So uh, hosting the FIFA Ballon. See, this is uh, and this is another, um, this is another lesson as well. Um, is that it's just so important to have clear cut goals and aspirations, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I was starting out, obviously I was, I, was, I was getting to terms with this career and this industry. And then once I started knowing more about it, I was like, okay, so here's my goal. My goal is to move from sports buzz and to do the big sporting codes, like to do your football and to be in the studio like Max Mapunyane, like Martin Locke, like Roberts, and like actually anchoring a show. Now, if you know your goals, then it's easier for you to actually attain them, you know? Um, and your path towards them becomes even clearer. So that when a producer comes to you and says, you know, you've been doing so well with Sports Buzz, which is what happened, how I got involved in football. You've been doing so well in, in, with Sports Buzz, but what do you, are you happy there? What do you actually want to do? Do you want to eventually maybe produce, you know, Sports Buzz, you know, have it be your show? And I was like, no, I want to be in the big studio. I want to host Mabaleng one day, you know, which was the big Saturday show that was hosted by all the gents. It was Martin Locke first, and then it was um, uh, Max Mafama Ponyani, and then it was Robert Marao that hosted it. I was like, I, I want to host Mabaleng, which was like almost unheard of because you'd never had a woman, and you'd never have, uh, and you never had like a, a junior presenter, you know, hosting those. Those shows, that show was hosted by the best of the best at the time, you know. So 
it's very important when the producer asks you okay so what is it that you actually want to do you're able to say this is what i want to do mm -hmm. leading up to 2010 after 2006 when we found out that uh we south africa was it 2005 or six when we found yes. out that south africa is going to host the mm -hmm. the fifa world cup you know lots of excitement and everything was gearing towards that now welcoming the world here and all of that um and i was given the great honor um of hosting the fifa confederations cup draw you know which was like on a global stage i hosted that i hosted the the final draw and that was big um and in the lead up to the world cup that's when i started uh getting to know and work with fifa I mean, come on, FIFA is like the, the sports mother, uh, football's yes. mother body, you know, mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. like the, the boss of all of these sporting uh, federations and organizations around the world. So that's when I started getting to know the people at FIFA and the kind of person that I am, even when I started at the SABC um, and then when I moved in and I was at Supersport, I'm the kind of person that I, I'm a people's person. I love to get to know people, you know, so when I start working with a certain organization, you know, I go right down to the ground, you know, yeah. um, I'm a very humble because I know where I, where I come from, you know, mm. very, very humble, humble beginnings, like with nothing. So it's so important as well to always keep your feet on the ground. You know, you're not better than anyone else. We're just all differently abled. People mm. are, are really good at, at, at different things, you know. Um, so I get to know everyone. Like I said, I used to come through to the SABC, sit with the people in the office, have lunch with them, hear about what it is that they do, you know. Um, and those people like me, the people that book the presenters um, to go out on certain jobs like me, the producers like me. That's why they would be like, if, if an opportunity came through, they'd be like, no, send Carol, you know, because I was so close to them and I got to know them uh, uh, very well. So that's another thing that's so important is be a people's person, get to know the people around you. Because trust me, those people around you, they all have a role to play in your progress. You know, yeah. you can't do it on, obviously you can't do it on your own. You need the producers to say, I want her to be on camera. Mm. Um, and then you need the sound engineers to always make sure that you are sounding unbelievable. If during a broadcast, they can hear that the, the mic is about to die or whatever, they could just leave you, you know, and almost sabotage you as it were. But because they like the person that you are and they're so good at their job, they'll make sure that they um, help you out. You know, when there's a break, they'll come and they'll say, you know, or, or they'll tell you, you're not holding the mic properly enough. You know, this is how he was holded. So there's a lot of people that contribute to your ultimate success. And I got to know the people at FIFA as well, very well. You know, I was very approachable. I'm a people's person, down to earth. And they started to really, really like me. Um, so the president at the time was Seb Blatter and the mm. secretary general was Jerome Falk. And Jerome really started to like me. And he also saw the wonderful work that I did with the other draws. And then I remember the biggest, the biggest event uh, just before the World Cup was the final draw, you know, and that's where they brought Charlize Theron. Mm. So I hosted with Charlize, you know, because she was a, a, a South African, but that is known globally, yeah. you know, whereas for me, I was still working with the SABC. So I was known all over South Africa, not even necessarily the, the, the continent because the SABC doesn't broadcast outside of South Africa. So um, they brought Charlize Theron and uh, David Beckham was there and all of these uh, Haley Gabriel Selassie, like top, top, top individuals. So I hosted that, hosted it so well, you know, um, even better than Charlize because, I mean, she's fantastic, but she doesn't know football, you know. So even better than Charlize. And I remember, I even have the photograph um, after the show. It was huge. Billions of people that tuned in. And Jerome came to me and he said, wow, you know what? You were like outstanding. You were absolutely amazing. And he said, if there's anything that you want, like, just let me know. Like, if there's anything you want to do. I said, listen, because it's something that I had written and it's some, it, 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 it's, mm. it's a, it's a, it was something that I'd visualized long ago. I said to him, listen, I want to host the FIFA Ballon d'Or. And he said, huh? Really? And I said, yes. He said, what you've just done is bigger than the Ballon d'Or. I said, no. Not to me. Those are like the Oscars of football, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what I've just done, yes, it gave me access to some of the, the great other uh, uh, sporting legends, right? But with the Ballon d'Or, it's the best of the best footballers in the world. And even in terms of the guest list, the people that come there, I mean, absolutely. I was like, no, I want to host the Ballon And he said, listen, yeah, you're, host you're hosting the next one. Done. And I was like, okay. So sure. that was in... 
uh, end of end of 2009. No, it was the beginning of 2010, the final draw, right? And end of 2010, I got a call, I think November 2010. Mm. And they were like, hi, Carol, uh, this is, uh, what was her name? I forget. And she's like, calling from the office of uh, the Secretary General, Jerome Falk, uh, for, um, calling from Zurich. Uh, uh, Jerome told us that you're going to be hosting uh, the Ballon d'Or. I, I almost fainted. I could, actually couldn't believe it, you know, because I, I really, when he said, yes, done, I thought, eh, okay, you know. But then as time goes by, you think, I ah, know he's probably forgotten, you know. Mm. Um, and yeah, and then I was flown out to Zurich. I went with my mom, you know, I was like, no, taking my mom. And it was just unbelievable. We got to meet, I mean, um, I, I remember the top three at the time for the football of the, the season uh, was uh, Xavi, mm. uh, who was playing for Barcelona. It was Messi and Ronaldo, Cristiano. Mm. So we got to meet them. You know, firsthand, I remember from the lady side, Marta, who was unbelievable, was uh, uh, one of them. So we got to meet all of the top um, nominees. We stayed in the same hotel as them. So, you know, after rehearsals, we were sitting there having lunch with them. It was unbelievable. But that was like football at that level. I, I got to walk the red carpet with Zidane and Jose Mourinho, <laughs> you know, sit next to my mom was sitting, sitting next to them, you know, she was out there. Um, and it was just unbelievable. Also, I mean, you're saying, well, was I nervous? Um, I think maybe a, a few minutes before going live, you know, but it but I think more than nerves it wasn't nerves it was excitement it was that adrenaline and that excitement you know I just I couldn't believe that one of my dreams was was now like you know coming true finally coming true I was so well prepared and I know what you know I know I know my job um so after I uttered the first words you know it was just smooth sailing from there I killed it it was unbelievable so that that's been like a, a major highlight and that's how I've got to yeah to host the fifa ballon d'Or, still the only african to have hosted it <laughs> <laughs> yes my love ayanda yes as carol mm -hmm. you, you know i'm sitting here and i'm telling myself there were times whereby i would say i feel pity for myself for the opportunities that i've let down and here you are telling your story yeah. which is very inspirational and so motivating and i told myself the moment i come i'm, I'm yeah. going outside i'm going to be a new person who's going yeah. to say i'm going to do this for myself because yeah. I remember I uh, wanted to be a lawyer like from the very first beginning mm. when I started school. So whenever I had to fail my first year and I decided to let law aside oh, wow. and then I stayed behind with a lot of things. I remember when I first watched you, that's when I fell in love with sport. Oh, yeah? I told myself, okay, not, I can do this. Yeah. But then <laughs> it was not easy as I said, like, I want to do this. Because there were moments where I'll try to do it in myself, but yeah. I will fail. And I'm like, but was Carol mm -hmm. And I told myself, but I was and at some point, I want to meet here at some point, but yeah. how am I going to be able to get in that to stage when mm -hmm. I feel frightened by like a small things whenever I get to be alone? Here, let me audition for myself, but yeah. I, I couldn't. <laughs> I yeah. couldn't. But then the the question that I'd love to ask you, like, give to everything, what are you most proud of? Oof, what am I most proud of? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm most proud a lot of things. Um, I'd say um, I'm most proud of how far I've come without any, like financially, you know, like uh, like you said, you know, I didn't study. I didn't yes. study for this. But how far I've come, really pushed by uh, tenacity, really pushed by my passion, uh, by my self-belief, and I was able to do it. You know, a lot of people say there's, there's the book smarts. So there's the people that will go to school and then they will get all of the degrees and they'll pass. And then there's the street smarts, you know, um, where, you know, you just know how to, you're, you're very street smart. You just know how to work very hard. Uh, you've got the personality. You get along with people. So I'm very proud of, uh, of the fact that regardless of the fact that we had no money, I was still able to get to these heights and as far as I've come without any money, just from self-belief and pushing myself um, and, and that I've been able to 
now take my family out of that situation that that i grew up in where we had no money sleeping without you know um and i'm also proud of the fact that yes i was able to with my entire family i was able to um put them on a plane for the first time get them to travel for the first time you know um and and that's another reason why you know a lot of people are like you love to travel so much. It's because those are all of the dreams. As a little girl, like I'd look at the plane and I'd be like, oh, you know, um, you know, you watch <laughs> movies and you're like, oh, is this what America's like? So all of my dreams as a little girl are now they be they 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 they're, they're becoming accomplished, you know. So I'm I'm very proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that you know, in the midst of me trying to establish myself and learn more about this and the challenges in the job, you know, there were challenges outside as well, you know, of of. Uh, a very abusive partner of me being pregnant at such a young age and it's something that I did not want and I didn't plan for but still being able to pick up the pieces raise my son you know have another one through so many like really tough challenges but I never crumbled you know um just made me stronger and I'm the woman that I am today because of those challenges as well you know so that's that's something that I also like to tell a lot of a lot of youngsters and a lot of you is, you know, you look at your circumstance, like you said, and you think, ah, oh, no, like, how am I, how am I ever, like, how, you, you can't see a way out. How am I going to do it? You know, why me? You know, I don't have the money. I don't have, I don't have anything, you know, I, that's where I come from. You know, I literally had nothing and I didn't even know. I mean, I went for auditions at after, but I knew there was no money for me. I passed them uh, as I knew I would, but I was like, well, what am I going to do? You know? And there was no light, no, you know, until um, Graham Richards said, hey, come to the SCBC and then da, 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 da. So, yeah, I'm proud of a lot of things <laughs> for that, that have brought me to the individual that I am today. Mm. There have been a lot of wins and gains along the way. So, Ms. Yes, Carol, Renee. <laughs> what is or was the best piece of advice you received or read? Mm, the best piece of advice that I received or read... Oof. It's been a lot. Um, I don't know if there's one best, but, uh, you know, I, I used to take, like when I was in high school, for example, I used to take inspiration. I used to be crazy about movies, you know, because mm. um, for me, watching movies was a, a way of escaping my reality you know life was so tough you know um we had nothing at home i was shielded uh, a, a lot from some of these hardships because i went to boarding school but i was very aware of what my mother and my younger sister were going through um and for me watching movies was like you know an escape and i'd watch like these worlds and you know um, these unbelievable cinderella stories you know so i really really loved that and i was inspired by I, I think some of the journeys of some of the actors like i remember i was uh, really inspired by john travolta you know and um i read about his journey as well same thing you know he came from nothing um he married very young his wife died in his arms like a lot of things but he was such an unbelievable actor and for him to get to where he was you know I was really inspired and i used to do you know back in the day you you magazine used to publish the addresses of like all of these like film stars and like uh, um um art music music um or, or musicians right mm. like famous musicians and you could like write fan mail to them so i used to write like fan mail i remember i wrote to like oprah i wrote to john travolta denzel washington you know and i just tell them like yo it is so tough like it's so like hopeless the situation that i'm in seems extremely hopeless like you know but i i know from your journey that you made it out you know from such difficult difficult um circumstances so like words of advice or whatever it was and i received from john travolta i he wrote back and i got back an autographed um photo a photo of his and then he wrote to carol bright sunny skies ahead <laughs> you know, and whew, so even now, you know, like oof, okay, you know, it came at a time when things were really, really tough, like really tough, and just hearing those words, he, you know, he was like basically saying, you know, just take a breath, you know, go through it. But the promise is at the end of the day, 
you know, things are going to be so much better. And for me, I think that was one of my most, it's, I, I have, obviously I still have it, but it's one of my most treasured possessions because he was so right, you know, um, before I knew it, like the life that I, that, I, that I lived after high school and once I got into the industry and the life that I'm living now, I never could have imagined that that could have been possible from where I was. Okay, do you, th yeah. do you still think uh, sport is a male-dominated uh, fraternity? And uh, what do you, do you think should be done to change that? Yeah, sport is still sheesh, very male-dominated. <laughs> and I think in all, in all areas, from you know, the athletes on the field of play uh, to administration, to you know, the sport leaders of uh, federations and organizations, to broadcasters like myself. You know, I look at... Um, uh, my colleagues, you know, here, abroad, all over the world, wherever I work. Um, and it's always like I find in a room where there's 10 of them, they might, if I'm lucky, there'll be one other female, you know, uh, uh, fellow sports broadcaster there. So it's still extremely male dominated. And, you know, when you ask what needs to be done to change it, that's a very loaded question. It's so much. But if I talk from my industry um, as a whole, I think it's starting to change now, you know, from when I started out 20 years ago, 21 years ago, where I didn't have, you know, uh, an example of what is possible as a woman in this industry, as a broadcaster. Now there are several, you know. Um, so I think that in itself is already um, I'm living proof that it can be done. And more and more young ladies now are saying, OK, now that's what I want to become, you know, and mm. there is an example, you know, that's there. And they're like, OK, this is how it should be done. This is what, you know, what I need to do to get there. So my journey may have taken a little bit longer uh, for me to get to where I am. Whereas nowadays, because now I'm here and I've walked that path, it's easier and it's quicker for young ladies now that are coming into the industry to, 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 to do that. But I think what's important is that those that want to come into the industry, the ladies, um, they need to make sure that they are knowledgeable, that they are passionate, that, that they know um, what uh, sport is about, that they can talk the talk, that they can be um, just the same and in fact, better than their male counterparts, because it's not easy. Um, like I said, you know, when I was starting out, I had to work 10 times harder and I still do it today. Even, you know, I'm here, I'm not comfortable. The work continues. The work happens on a daily, all the time. You need to keep bettering yourself, keep setting those trends, keep being better than your male counterparts, because uh, the men aren't questioned. The men aren't going to be grilled. It's so much easier for the men, you know, mm. because it's a given that uh, men belong in this industry. So with the with the woman with ladies we need to fight harder um so that's that's i just need to say they they need to be stronger they need to fight harder um and they need to be very well informed and ready in order to to last in this industry yeah and carol you've you've had an exciting journey or inspirational yeah. journey um would you change anything from your journey to to, to today or hmm. Would I change? Yeah, when I look back, mm. maybe there's a, a thing or two that I would like to tweak. For example, I think that... Um, actually, no. Because I was going to say, um, you know, during the World Cup, mm. I was with the national broadcaster, right? They were the, the host broadcasters of the World Cup. And I was so excited when we were announced as the host because I thought, you know what? I'm going to be there in the studio. I'm going to be finally anchoring like a, an international football match, you know, mm -hmm. World Cup game. Uh, and then the time came and I wasn't. I was given like a breakfast show that I hosted with Trevor Noah. And I just felt like, you know, I was like, wait what i'm hosting a show with a comedian <laughs> you know i felt like they didn't appreciate me enough uh. um and you know i remember while tamukwena uh was the anchor of the football matches and then they brought in a whole bunch of people from abroad you know and i felt like i really felt almost betrayed <laughs> by the broadcaster <laughs> to say but guys like Mm. You know, this was the time, you know, to allow us to shine, you know, and I'd hosted the um, the draws and I was so good. I was one of the top. It was Walton Roberts um, who hosted. 
And I really felt like, no, in fact, no, Robert had already moved to Supersport. Mm -hmm. It was Wild Tamukwen. And then the, uh, the other guys were from abroad. And I was given a breakfast show with a comedian. I felt like that was just like, <laughs> I felt so betrayed. So betrayed. I was so upset. Like, if you guys could see me before those shows, you know, and, you know, uh, Trevor didn't know anything about football and he'd be making jokes. And I'm like trying to be serious, you know, because I know the world is like watching. Mm -hmm. The FIFA guys are here, you know, and he would like make all of these weird jokes and I'm trying to be serious, you know, but so I felt very betrayed. And I, I, and I was going to say, I feel as if if I had moved to Supersport maybe before, but then if I wasn't with the SABC, even in the lead up to the World Cup, I probably wouldn't have hosted the final draw um, and the Confederations Cup draws. I wouldn't have met the FIFA guys. Um, I wouldn't have then eventually uh, hosted the FIFA ba Ballon d'Or. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I guess maybe no. Um, you know, everything that I went, even the hardships, you know, mm -hmm. those were learnings and they, mm -hmm. they just made me stronger and they made me even better at my job. So. Yeah, I think my journey played itself out the way it should have for me to be the Carol that I am today. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Guys, thank you so oh. much. You had some amazing <laughs> questions. <laughs> you made me cry. <laughs> Happy <laughs> tears, just reliving it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I am. I'm inspired as well by you guys because, as you said, you know, some of the lessons that I, that I spoke to you guys about, you've most certainly followed through with, the, with some of them in terms of taking the initiative, saying, hey, I'm going to sign up for this, to have this conversation. Clearly, you're, you're interested in pursuing whatever it is that you want to do. I know broadcaster, also broadcaster over there, uh, yes, broadcaster, yes. lawyer, broadcaster. Yes. <laughs> oh, and yeah, broadcaster, mm. lawyer. You know, um, so so I can already tell that you're very motivated individuals, very strong individuals, and you know what? Just continue um, in this path. Really believe in yourself. Have faith, um, and also know, you know, through my journey that you don't have to be well put together. You don't have to come from a perfect background to make it. You know, um, it's 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 often us that were. Um, you know, went through all of these very uh, hardships. It's often us that end up really, really shining, you know, just like diamonds. And that's why I love athletes as well, because if you read and, and, and hear about their journeys of like 95% of athletes, just so tough starting out, really, really, really tough. But to see them shining now is like, you know, inspirational. So it's possible. It's definitely possible. Just have to set your mind to it and it will happen. So in, uh, to say thank you, I've got a gift, um, oh. a very inspirational book that talks about some of these um, habits that I told you guys about. Mm -hmm. um, it's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I love it. Sean Covey. So I want to leave you with that. Renee, thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Carol. Sandile, it was an honor meeting you. Zenande, thank you. Thank you, Spiso. Thank you, Ms. Carol. Yes, thank Ayanda. You. Thank you. you guys are amazing. So keep doing what you're doing. And yeah, I love meeting all of you. And I wish you the best. Thank, thank you. you so much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah.